thank you for joining us this morning in person, online. So glad to have you here and with us. When we, when we choose to allow someone to influence us, so uh, we read their book, right? We, uh, we listen to their podcast, uh, watch the TV show, or, or maybe it's a more personal invitation. We, uh, we, we invite them out for coffee or, or, or for lunch. Uh, we, we say, could, could, I, could I consult with you? about something, when we, when we choose to allow someone to influence us, kind of by extension, we are, we're choosing almost in advance to heed their advice. Maybe not quite, you know, right? Maybe you weigh what they say and decide whether or not that's, that's good advice for you. But when we put ourselves into that kind of relationship, the expectation is we're gonna grow. grow. You know, we put ourselves into that relationship because we believe that uh, that individual could maybe help us in, in some way, shape, or form, informal or, or a more formal mentoring kind of relationship. The pastor that first hired me um, 30, 29 years ago um, uh, was a guy named Justin Dennison. Here's a picture of Justin and his wife Sue, and um, uh, they were from the UK. I was excited to work with, uh, with Justin. He, um, um, in addition to you know, being a kind of a seasoned leader, he um, had a lot of experience with worship. Now, oddly, he wasn't a, worship, he wasn't a musician. Um, back in the UK, he would often lead worship kind of as the spiritual director for a service and then kind of hand it over to the musicians to carry it forward. Um, he became uh, sort of a sought-after clinician or speaker uh, in the UK at a number of events that took place there. And then that, some of that followed when he moved to Canada and started pastoring the church that he then invited me to come and, and join him as his worship pastor um, at. Um, before he hired, he wanted to sort of suss things out, so he invited me to attend a worship event with him and then offer some insights, you know, offer what did I, what did I observe, what did I think. He wanted to kind of, you know, yeah, try me out, test me out. Good leadership. Well done, Justin. Because that was the kind of direction he wanted to go in, and in, in those days, that was a lot of years ago, um, it, it, was, it was a little less common in, in churches. Um, I still use uh, the definition for worship that uh, I first heard Justin use. Um, worship is all that I am, responding to all that he is. That's a pretty decent definition of worship. What is worship? What does it mean when we worship? It's all that I am, responding to all that he is. Um, a close second might be, uh, worship is me putting, in God's, me putting God in his place while he puts me in my place. Uh, worship is me putting God in his place while he puts me in my place. I, that, I think that's funny. You can allow it to laugh, but you know, it's, <laughs> it's the end of this exchange of where I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of his greatness. Uh, the first one's better. You know, worship is all that I am responding to all that he is. Uh, who are the people who have influenced who you are today? That They've invested in your life and you were changed because they made that investment in you. Uh, Justin's wife, Sue, was in that picture. Um, she was a significant influence in my life. God had gifted Sue with a, a gift for evangelism, and you couldn't be near her without it becoming contagious. Uh, it, it was kind of the original virus, and it was a much better one than the one we're dealing with right now. Um, but, but she just had this effervescent enthusiasm for sharing sharing her faith with the people who were around her, and people responded when she did. And there were lots of people in our church uh, the, because of her witness and because she inspired others also to engage in that. You know, I ended up working closely with her because one of her strategies for sharing our faith as a church were uh, to create some events that we could bring our non-Christian friends to and invite them to other friends and kind of build some relationship. We, we did some things we called friendship dinners bringing a spe special speaker. Uh, normally the arts were part of it, so that was kind of my role, you know, was putting some music together for these kind of events. The, ch the church that we were at together we had a long history of doing kind of big Christmas musicals. It was a thing back in that day, and, and, and everybody was primed, you know, bring your friends, bring your neighbors, bring your, it was, it was a, a lovely thing. Uh, Easter would be another season, some certain services, Christmas Eve, things like that, and, and we just looked 
that these would be key opportunities when uh, our friends could hear about Jesus and, and we could maybe open a door of conversation. Um, why not take them out for coffee after the event? Or in some cases we provided coffee or meal or dessert or something like that and, and the opportunity to, to chat was right there. Stay, linger, band's gonna play, um, enjoy, enjoy this time together and, and get to know one another better and, and maybe take the conversation into a spiritual conversation. That was Sue. Um, love her. She is such a sweet. She um, she's such a sweet daughter of Jesus. Uh, she, as far as I know, was responsible for bringing the Alpha Course to Canada. Uh, they came from the UK. They were familiar um, and with Nikki Gumbel and, and Holy Trinity Brompton in London, and um, and ours was the first or the second church in Canada to actually host the Alpha Course. And she's continued to have, be very active, you know, in that. Now it's all across Canada. In fact, now, the, the most recent Alpha videos are called the Alpha Film Series. They were actually produced out of Canada, not like because Canadians were funding it. Like the, Canada, the Canadian Alpha Canada has become kind of a catalyst around the world for um, sharing, inviting people to share their faith through the Alpha Course. So that was Sue. Man, she, she influenced me, she influenced others uh, around me in a really beautiful and wonderful way. Now, when you follow someone, you're, you're choosing to, when you invite them to influence you, you're choosing to, um, to heed the advice that they bring, bring or at least you're, there's some expectation in that relationship. And, and Justin often had input to the, the worship things that we were doing, what we were doing, how we did it, um, comments, requests. Sometimes it was stronger than a request. Command is a little you know, stronger, that's what I mean to say that, but you get the idea. Uh, you maybe know me well enough that, that sometimes that would chafe. Like, I, I think I have a better way of doing it. Thank you very much. Um, and, and yet, you know, even in those moments when um, maybe I didn't want to do what was being asked of me, um, or, or maybe we had even had a discussion about whether that was the best way to do whatever it was that was being asked of me. Um, as I look back, and I think I recognized this at the time, um, I, I could observe that the instructions were coming from Justin in the kind of manner that we see the Apostle Paul bringing instruction to Timothy here. Uh, the older, bringing instruction to the younger. Uh, the more experienced, um, not in a heavy-handed way, but in a seasoned way, in a mature way, in a loving way, knowing that the purposes of Jesus were, uh, were at work. Um, love Justin, let's to stay in touch with them. They're out in uh, Vancouver now. Um, here, here's somebody else that I wanted to introduce you to, a different kind of connection. This is Nancy Millwood. In that same period of time, she was the pers first person in my life who said, I'm being called by Jesus to pray for you. That was a sobering thing. You know, uh, the, she, she, she had a, a gift of intercession and she was being called to pray for me. Um, I, I'd been in, in a couple of situations where leaders were saying, look, you can't ever pray enough. Um, and in fact, if you're the only person praying for your ministry, that is not nearly enough. And, and Nancy was one who said, I'm gonna do it. For, for about a decade, every day, she would pray for me, our ministry, she would pray for our family, uh, and she would intercede before Jesus on our behalf. I gotta tell you, when you know that there are people who are in, in, that engaged in your ministry, but in a different kind of way, it changes you, it humbles you. Uh, it, it reminds you that this is not about you. God has a work that he wants to do. And I'm so grateful for Nancy. I reached out to her this week just with a word, word of appreciation for her uh, and what she did as, as a first of many uh, who have and do uh, pray for me, our church, our family, your family. Um, thank you. Uh, especially to those of you who have a gift of, of intercession and who are willing to spend that time before the Lord in prayer. The reality is that while we pray for leaders, we pray for those who are in authority over us, who have some kind of responsibility for us, we are all following someone. Um, and, and so the, the words that Paul is going to speak to Timothy here today is going to um, uh, influence each of us, is going to have an impact for each of us. We're all following someone, and, and let me just say thank you uh, for following me. Uh, you followed me this morning in, in, in music. Um, some of you have been here for the past 10 years, and, and we have one foot in front of the next, tried to find our way in following Jesus, and, and there are some who are given a commission 
The, the Lord says, look, this person is gonna have a, a, a pivotal role in seeing, catalyzing things to move forward. And it's true of our board of elders. So I respond to our board of elders. I respond to our district superintendent. Um, I'm not a, I, 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 we, we are all following someone. And, and thank you when, when you've made the choice that we're, we're gonna follow the leaders in our church. We're gonna contribute, we're gonna speak, but at the end of the day, we're gonna follow. Um, we're all following someone, and it's one of the takeaways that I'm hoping that we'll get from this series as we, as we observe Paul, as we observe his words to Timothy, and as we respond and take them on as our own. Paul's assignment from Jesus becomes the church's assignment from Jesus. And, and, and this morning we're gonna encounter it, and it all begins with prayer. Paul's assignment from Jesus becomes the church's assignment for Jesus, and it all begins with prayer. Prayer. It's the only appropriate starting point. For ministry, it's the only appropriate starting point for, for, for us in our lives, for you in your family, uh, for you in your place of work. Let me read it for you. I'm in 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 15. I'm going to read from the message this morning. Eugene Peterson is the translator of the message. Uh, his goal was to put, it in, put the, the, the New Testament, actually ultimately all of the scriptures, Hebrews, uh, Old Testament and New, into everyday language, and um, he, he smooths over some things I don't have time to deal with today. We're gonna talk about those things next week, um, but I, I was helpful, appreciative. Why don't we stand together, and we're just gonna to attend to the word of the Lord um, fully, with give it our full attention this morning. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter two, verses one through 15. The first thing I want you to do is pray. Pray every way you know how, for everyone you know. Pray especially for rulers and their governments to rule well so that we can be quietly about our business of living simply in humble contemplation. This is the way our Savior God wants us to live. He wants not only us, but everyone saved. You know, everyone to get to know the truth we've learned, that there's one God and only one. One priest mediator between God and us, Jesus, who offered himself in exchange for everyone held captive by sin to set them all free. Eventually the news is going to get out. This and this only has been my appointed work. Getting this news to those who have never heard of God and explaining how it works by simple faith and plain truth. Since prayer is at the bottom of all this, what I want mostly is for men to pray, not shaking angry fists at enemies, but raising holy hands to God. And I want women to get in there with the men in humility before God, not primping before a mirror or chasing the latest fashions, but doing something beautiful for God and becoming beautiful doing it. I don't let women take over and tell the men what to do, they should study to be quiet and obedient along with everyone else. Adam was made first, then Eve. Woman was deceived first, our pioneer in sin, with Adam right on her heels. On the other hand, her childbearing brought about salvation, reversing Eve. But this salvation only comes to those who continue in faith, love, and holiness, gathering it all into maturity. You can depend on this. This is the word of the Lord. May you help us understand it this morning as we uh, look and give it our, our full attention. You may be, may be seated. As I said, I read from the message because uh, Peterson just kind of takes some harsh edges off some stuff. If you were really reading in another translation, um, and maybe even from this one, you'd look, listen to those last few verses and you're like, huh, what's that about? Well, we're gonna spend some time talking about what that's about. Uh, next Sunday, we're gonna kind of look at it from one perspective, one common way of, of translating that into modern, what do we do with this? Um, and, and the following Sunday, we're gonna actually go in the same passage of scripture and look at it from a different perspective. And, and in both, we're gonna kind of delve into what, is, what do the scriptures say about uh, our role as genders, as men and women, and how should we try to live that out today? But I don't wanna get into that until we've seen the context of where it comes from. As we look at the broader, uh, the broader whole of what's being said in this chapter in its context in the book uh, that Paul has written to Timothy, uh, this first one. 
Uh, so, so this morning I'm asking us to kind of stay focused on this bigger picture and, and capture what Paul has for us. Paul's big concern here is that the good news about Jesus would be rightly and fully understood. Uh, it's it, in all its simplicity. Rightly and fully understood. And, and he doesn't want anything to get in the way of that. Uh, it reminds me of the heart of my, my sister Sue, my friend Sue. Um, like, like she was, like, let's just remove all the obstacles we can and make sure that people get a glimpse of Jesus. But if this is gonna happen, we need, we, need, we need to engage in fervent and persistent prayer. If we're gonna share the gospel effectively, we must start with prayer. I'm gonna say it multiple times this morning. If we're gonna share the gospel effectively, we must, we must start with prayer. It's gonna be, Paul's gonna inform both the content of our prayer and also the posture of our prayer. And Paul's calling Timothy, by extension, us. Uh, firstly, to attend to the priority of prayer. Okay, the first seven verses of what I just read. The priority of prayer. Uh, verse eight, uh, lifting holy hands, not arms. Uh, and, and then verses nine through 15, showing our beauty, not our bling. So that's the outline that you can download it to the, uh, from the church app or from the website, or you, there's hard copies in the sanctuary here. Um, uh, that's the outline for this morning. So let's look at the first couple of, well, the first seven verses, but we'll start with the first two. The priority of prayer, verses one and two, first Timothy chapter two. I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch translations here um, and, and get to some specific words. This is the English standard version, the ESV. First of all then, Paul writes, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life godly and dignified in every way. So, so on the one hand, uh, Paul uses four words there at the beginning that, that kind of mean the same thing. And, and in doing so, he creates emphasis. This urge to pray is really important. But there's also something to be seen if we look at each word because they are slightly different. He, he says, he's urging that supplications or the NIV translates it petitions, okay? So this is the kind of thing that you would do before a king. You'd bring a petition, or before a person in authority. You would bring the need and the reasons for the petition that we would bring. Petitions, supplications, uh, prayers, uh, proskues in the Greek. It means simply to ask, simply gonna ask. Uh, we bring our petitions before the king, we bring our requests before the king, intercessions, and this puts the emphasis on the other. Uh, um, I, I am interceding before the king of kings. I'm going to the king of kings on behalf of you, on behalf of someone else. It's, it's intercession. And Paul says we are to intercede, uh, firstly, for all people, because he's longing that all people would encounter Jesus. But then he goes specifically and calls us to pray for those who are in authority over us. Kings and all who are in high positions, the N-E-T. I'll keep jumping around between translations here. Kings and all who are in all, kings and all who are in high positions. Hmm. I, 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 I find it stunning. Paul's writing this almost certainly about A.D. 64. He just got out of jail from the kings and people in high positions. In Rome, uh, he's under Nero at this window of history, and he says, pray for them. Pray for them. I, I don't know what you think about the politicians who, who give leadership to our community or our province or our nation, and frankly, it doesn't matter. Pray for them. Because, because God has a work that he wants to do. I'll say more about that in just a moment. Inter petitions, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings for all people and particularly for kings and those in authority over us. And listen to what the, the he says, we're to pray that purpose statement that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Isn't that nice? Paul's really concerned about your comfort. <laughs> that, that's really not what he's getting at. He's not particularly concerned about your comfort, he's more concerned about your witness. That you would be able to live a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified, so that it could become the, the springboard to the evangelism that he's talking about, that everyone would know. 
To intercede means to stand in the gap between heaven and earth, uh, to become the one who says, I am willing, I'm willing to represent this person here before that being, almighty, all-powerful being there. To plead with God, and, 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 and in many cases, to plead with him on behalf of those who, who can't plead for themselves or don't know enough in this area to plead for themselves, at least at this stage of their lives. And we're going to, because God is concerned about good governance, good governance results in peace and quiet. And, and it allows the, the followers of Jesus to pursue Jesus with godliness and with, with dignity. But as I said, it's, more, it's about more than just our comfort. And even it's more, about more than our growth in piety. The purpose of such intercessions is that these peaceful, quiet conditions would become the springboard for mission. The conditions would be right so that we can freely tell people about Jesus the hope of the world, why we have placed our faith in him. And men might be able to freely share that with everyone. So we pray. We start with prayer. It's the foundation of everything that we would try to do. And Paul goes on, verse three, he says, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, now, as I read that, I was reminded of the Apostle John's words. I bet many of you have it memorized. John chapter three, verse 16. Why don't you say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. His first priority toward that desire, the fulfillment of that desire as Paul words it here, is that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made because God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. All people. No one left behind. God's desire, his want, his wish, is that everyone would come to the knowledge of the truth. Of course, they have some say in this, Right? In fact, we're beginning to get this idea in the text that Paul's giving us because we're being called to pray. We pray, God calls, maybe you've read that in the Gospel of John or elsewhere, and they must choose. We pray, God calls, they must choose, and it results in acceptance. Now there's a mystery in that, and I don't profess to try to fully understand it, to know how exactly that works. There is mystery in that, that exchange, the extraordinary thing that God would give us free will, say in the midst of this. And, and yet, in there, he would say, pray. And he would say, and I gotta call them, and they somehow need to respond with acceptance. It doesn't happen without God, but, but, but the, the starting point here is that we're supposed to pray. We have some responsibility in this. There's priority in our praying. Verse five for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men. That man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. The Paul describes Jesus in extraordinarily exclusive terms. There's one God, only one. And there is one mediator, one way to him, one broker. There's only one mediator qualified to broker the relationship between God and man, and it's Jesus. And he qualified himself because he gave himself as a ransom for all. Now, I realize these are big words. Last Sunday, we talked about the importance of, of, of accurate doctrine. There are truths that we, uh, our faith hangs on. They are the supreme truths. We talked a bit about it when we were in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the fall. Supreme truths that, that matter above and beyond all other truths. Now, now, we said last Sunday, we are not saved by orthodox belief. We are saved by faith in Jesus. But orthodox belief guides our faith. Unorthodox belief can undo your faith. You end up believing in a God that doesn't exist. You end up following uh, people, think, believing things about yourself that just are not true. So it's important, 
But faith in Jesus is what saves us. And now we try to understand and apply so that we would be found increasingly faithful, so that you would look increasingly like Jesus. The language that Paul uses here reminds us of something that we refer to as the doctrine of atonement. How is it that God could possibly reconcile me, a sinner, to, to himself? And of course, the answer is Jesus, but inquiring minds want to dig a little deeper and say, but, but how does that exchange actually take place? And one of the answers over the centuries of Christendom has been, well, the ransom theory of atonement. Uh, that, that Jesus gave himself and thereby we were set free. Paul uses the word ransom here. Uh, We've we got to reckon with it. We've got to figure out what, how do we... Uh, it's very close to uh, another theory of atonement that probably is the most helpful one and it's referred to as the substitutionary atonement theory. Substitu Jesus became my substitute. That language is here too. Jesus gave himself. In giving himself, he became my substitute. He absorbed the wrath that my sin deserved. He got what I deserved and I got his freedom, forgiveness, kindness. This is extraordinary. It's an extraordinary exchange in the spiritual realm that results in, in all who've put our faith and our trust in Jesus, having the assurance of both his presence now and living in his presence throughout all eternity. The doctrine of atonement. C.S. Lewis actually helped us a lot here. We're just putting human words to a concept that I, I would suggest is greater than we have full capacity to comprehend or understand. Uh, does it surprise you uh, that God's ways are higher than your ways, that his thoughts are greater than your thoughts? Uh, probably not, okay, if, if you've read a little bit of scripture. So we're trying to understand something. C.S. Lewis did us a great favor in this, in the Chronicles of Narnia, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. Maybe you've read it or seen the movie or, or something. Uh, but Edmund had betrayed the family and gone over to the White Witch, and Aslan, the, the, the son of the emperor over the seas, the great lion, he gave himself up and was executed on the stone table so that Edmund could go free. A uh, pretty powerful picture. Again, human words, language, trying to grapple with something that truly is beyond ourselves. How could God love us this way? How could he affect and maintain perfect justice? Just letting you off the hook, that's not justice. He had to take the fall for you. Paul's referencing that here, and it's at the heart of the gospel, and it's simple, but you also recognize there's complexity to it. Here's the simplicity of it. Jesus loves you, and he invites you to follow him. Come and make a confession of your sin. Call your misdeeds what he calls them, and, and turn and begin to follow him. Walk a new way. It's, it's awfully simple. And Paul says it begins with the priority of prayer. For the gospel, that's what I've just explained, for the gospel to be effective, we must start with prayer. And, and so we talk about the content of prayer. Petitions, prayers, thanksgivings. Uh, we, we present our requests to God. And now he moves on to talk about the, 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 rather than the content of our prayer, I think I said that wrong, the content of our prayer. Now he moves to talk about the posture of our prayer. Lifting holy hands, not arms. Okay, that's just me having a little bit of fun with words, you know, emphasizing the idea that began back in chapter one, uh, that there was, con there was fighting going on in the church. Arms. You know, sometimes we talk about guns being in arms. Okay, I, I, I just don't know. I don't, you're not really giving me a lot of reaction here, so I'm not sure whether, whether, whether you're following me or you're like, he's just mumbling up there. Um, uh, lift holy hands, not arms. Uh, back in chapter one, we realized that there were meaningless discussions going on. There were myths and spiritual pedigrees that were leading to conflict within the church and they were wasting their time on things that just didn't matter. Get back to Jesus, is what Paul was calling them to. And in chapter two then, he picks up this idea in verse eight. He says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. 
Chapter one, verse five, he said, the purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. Now, now we discussed that part last Sunday, that that, those are character words. And, And godly character is formed intentionally. You must make some choices to pursue him if you're gonna grow in godly character. Now we've moved from content, petitions, uh, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving, to posture. What's the posture of my heart? Well, what's the posture of my life? Specifically, my heart. What is driving the things that I do? Well, Well, Paul says, I want them to lift holy hands in prayer. The only way your hands get whole, get holy, it is through the redemptive work of Jesus, the atoning work of Jesus. And now because of that work, you have been declared holy, you've been justified before the Father, you've been given a standing that you did not deserve, just as if I'd never sinned, just as if I'd always obeyed. A little more doctrine, sorry for the big words. Maybe not. These are words that are really important, friends. These are words we need to understand. In order that we would fully appreciate what what God has done for us through Jesus. Lifting holy hands. They've been made holy by the work of Jesus. A pure heart, a clear conscience, genuine faith. Now, now we can live as believers filled with love. Because he has purified us and enabled it to be possible for us to enter the holy of holies and not just be disintegrated in the moment gasoline of my sin in the presence of the fire of his holiness. Can't coexist. I gotta have Jesus. Let me move on. Man, lift holy hands, not arms. And then Paul calls the women to show beauty, not bling. Look at verse nine. Likewise also, I I pray, I desire, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. Paul's longing here, ladies, uh, that the, the first thing that someone else would notice about you is your virtue. It's your virtue. Rather than your fashion sense, he's not opposed to you dressing nicely. That's not what this is about. But the primary accessory of your life needs to be the good works that you would do for Jesus. He wants your virtuous conduct to be that which you become known for. This was as difficult in the first century as it is in ours. You may have noticed, um, you may have noticed that men are easily distracted by women's beauty. Um, I mean, styles change, but that's a fact that hasn't changed. Uh, The sense of acceptable fashion has migrated over the years, Uh, yet fully covered or or mostly uncovered, uh, men are attracted. Uh, These days, hot day in the summer at the beach, and for many, a string bikini is acceptable. Not for my daughters, just to be clear, Uh, but but, but it's not uncommon. Um, and, And modesty has meant different things over the centuries. And so, ladies, I'm not picking on you here at all. In fact, I want to honor you. I really want to honor you because God made you very beautiful. Yay, Jesus. And we, it's appropriate for us to acknowledge his good work. You know, maybe in a way that's not dissimilar to to looking at the beauty of a sunrise or the beauty of a sunset and saying, God did good work. Oh, my goodness. You know, the, 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 the mystery, the spectacle of a mountain scenery or, or the prairie uh, vistas or, or the power and the wonder and the beauty of the ocean. Now, none of those things have ever tempted me to sin, I don't think. So there is something different here in Paul's calling for, for modesty. Men can be dist- distracted by, by women's beauty. It can lead to sin. And, and ladies, you need to know this is not your problem. This is our problem. Gentlemen, gentlemen, we need to take Paul's advice, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, and take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. Not allow that thought to go beyond beautiful like a sunset, she is. Glorious like the ocean. Taking every thought captive and not letting it go anywhere that it should not go. 
I, I was introduced to this concept in Sunday school, kid zone, Sunday school when I was a kid. Maybe some of you uh, have been around the church long enough to remember, uh, be careful little eyes what you see, be careful little eyes what you see, for the Father up above is looking down in love, so be careful little eyes what you see. Uh, it goes on to talk about where your feet go and little hands what you do. It, it, um, there is responsibility that we have before God uh, to command our lives. It's one of the beautiful things about fasting on a complete rabbit trail. When you fast for a meal, uh, for, for a day, uh, for longer perhaps, you are exercising command over one of the most basic needs we have as human beings, food. And if you can command yourself through a meal or through a day or maybe through a couple of days, uh, then surely, surely we can command our eyes Command our thoughts about where they go. It's calling for godly discipline uh, among us. Now over the next three Sundays, we're gonna talk about uh, men and women. We're gonna talk about our roles in the church. Uh, we're gonna allow what Paul says here at the end of chapter two, 1 Timothy, uh, to, to be a catalyst, to be a springboard into inquiry. And as I said earlier, we'll look at it one Sunday from one perspective, kind of a primary way of thinking about these things, uh, the ones that I find are most uh, compelling. Uh, and the second Sunday, we're gonna look at it from a, a different perspective. Again, uh, why would I be convinced of this? Um, and, and then we're gonna let the Holy Spirit just kind of teach us. Uh, not sure where it goes, but we're gonna let him teach us. Uh, but but right, if we go there now, we're gonna just get completely distracted. Maybe I've done that already because Paul's calling us back to this posture of worship, of, of propriety and modesty, uh, of, uh, of, of men not lifting angry hands, stepping out of a place of quarrel that the, the, the church in Ephesus seemed to be caught up in. And if we are gonna be effective in, in representing the gospel, Jesus gave himself as a ransom. If we're gonna represent that gospel, that hope, we, we must start with prayer. Priority of prayer, lifting holy hands, not arms. Showing beauty, not bling. Allowing our virtue to be that which we're known for. Now let me just turn some of this on, uh, on the head for a moment, especially these last two points. So, so does this mean that women are never angry or quarrelsome? No, okay, we, we, we know. Um, by singling men out and saying, I want men everywhere to lift holy hands, uh, not quarreling or, or in anger, um, is, he giving, is he giving the ladies a free pass? Be as angry and as quarrelsome as you want? Of course not, right? Um, uh, by asking the women uh, to allow their virtue to outshine their other lovely attributes, uh, is, is Paul demeaning the importance of godly character for the men? No. no. Is he saying that men don't have to do good things, good work in the name of Jesus? Of course not. So there's an, there's an aspect of this which is genderless, and yet he emphasizes it for reason. What would that reason be? But why would he tell men to pray without fighting? Or, or why would he tell ladies to serve more and primp less? And, and, the, and the answer, at least in the first century, was that this might be the predisposition. This might be the direction that we are most tempted to go in. And so he speaks to the men and he speaks to the women. And at the same time, there are some principles that need to cross genders. Maybe we tilt in one direction. What about you? Maybe you're not the stereotypical. Maybe you tilt in the other direction. But if we take it out of the realm of generalities, to the specifics of you and me, um, do you tend to be contentious? Is, 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 is one of your early response to put your fists up? To, to get angry? To quarrel? Well, Paul would, he would just call us to observe uh, Christian principles uh, that Jesus has taught us. We come and we confess. Confession means to call it what Jesus calls it. That's sin. I, I confess and then I repent. I begin to walk in a new way. Are you overly concerned with what other people think about you? Primp a little more, prep a little less, or a little more. 
That's genderless, friends. Overly concerned about what other people think of you? Call it what Jesus calls it. It's pride. It's maybe not allowing, maybe not, back to our definition of worship. Thank you, Justin. It's not putting God in his place and me in my place. It's not reminding myself that his opinion of me is the one that most matters and it's the one that I most want to seek for his glory. And, and, and sometimes we need, let me say this, sometimes we need some help with, with any one of these areas. Man, we've, we've got Christian counselors that live right in this community. Certainly in Calgary, a little distance. Uh, but, but seek out someone who would sit with you. Walk through some of the things that are going on. What are the motivations? Why, would you, why, why does this keep tripping you up? We'll actually even help you with that. Um, if, if you uh, need counseling, um, we'll recommend someone. We'll cover the full cost of the first appointment. And if you need assistance, we'll cover up to half of subsequent appointments. Um, kind of agree to a, a, a window of time, a number of appointments, something like that. But, but we would... We don't want anyone to feel like you don't have access to help. Kareen Neerum's on our pastoral, or on our staff now. Uh, she, uh, she has great skill in this, more than I. Uh, could be a decent starting point. Uh, she pulled her hamstring this week. So she's in a series of recovery. So it might be a Zoom consultation or a telephone consultation. But we, we're working on our building our family ministries team so that you have support. when we realize that Holy Spirit has been putting his finger on something particular. I tend to be contentious. Uh, I, I think too much about what other people think of me or say about me. Um, he invites us to come in confession and repentance. I'm gonna invite Anthony to come. Anthony's uh, interning as our uh, youth ministry's intern. Worship team, if you'd come as well. Uh, I asked him if he'd come and, and pray a pastoral prayer over us. And, and then lead us in confession and repentance. And then the, the, you would hear the declaration of forgiveness that Jesus makes possible. And, and then we're, we're gonna go to the Lord's table together and sing a song and worship as we, as we close. We come to you today, oh God, with open hearts. And we thank you that you are God who is wholly righteous. Despite our sin, God, you sent your son down to not just die, but to actually dwell among us and to teach us of a love that would fill us to the brim. A love that would give us pure hearts, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. What a merciful gift you have given us, God. We thank you for your son, and we thank you for the love that we have, have since been filled with God. Father, apart from the love you have demonstrated to us and fulfilled through your Son on the cross, we are incapable of being a holy people. So we want to confess. And I just ask if we'd all take a moment. Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all of the world. You're the, yours are the hands and yours are the feet and yours are the eyes and you are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. So Father, we come and we seek repentance and we thank you for your son who gave his life for us so that we would be called children of the Lord most high. Amen.